Hello, my name is Kevin Stone, and I'm one of the pastors here at Proclamation Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Proclamation Online. Here at Proclamation, our values are to engage all people, to grow as the family of God, to go because Christ came for us, and to proclaim Jesus and not ourselves. No matter your age, race, gender, or socioeconomic status, we want to engage you with the life-changing message of the gospel. We believe that the local church is God's plan. And while we're excited to serve you through these online resources, this should never replace your commitment to your local church. If you happen to live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, I want to personally invite you to one of our Sunday morning gatherings at either the 9 a.m. or 10.45 a.m. service. If God is using this church to impact your life, you can partner with us financially by giving online through our website. And if this is your first time checking out Proclamation, we don't want you to feel compelled by us to give. We're just glad that you're here. We hope that this message helps you to fix your eyes on Jesus and helps drive you deeper into the gospel. I, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I feel at peace every time Benji talks. <laughs> the whole time I was thinking, I was like, can he narrate my life? Can he just read books for me? Benji, my goodness. <laughs> I love you, man. Uh, well, good morning, family. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I'm excited as we jump into this text today, um, uh, the conversion of, of Saul. As we open up uh, the Word of God, as we see this story, uh, we, if you're familiar with Scripture, we know that Saul would go on to change his name to Paul. Uh, he would write uh, up to almost half of the New Testament, what you hold in your hand, um, and not only that, some scholars say that he would go on to plant uh, anywhere from 14 to 20 churches. Uh, my man had it. At, he, was, he was awesome. One of the greatest missionaries, church planters that we can think of, right? But before he was that, uh, he was not. <laughs> he was broken. He was sinful. Uh, and it's one of those things where as we look at his story, my hope is that uh, some of us may see our lives in him, right? That there's something in him that we can relate to, that we were lost, but by God's grace we've been found. That we could leave out of here in a posture of awe of God's grace in our own lives. But then even if we, uh, for those who have experienced the grace of God and we have that awe, that there are some in here who have yet to see the grace of God and that you would respond to it rightly in the same way that Saul did. You know, uh, the very first time we actually see Saul in the scriptures is Acts chapter 7. Uh, and it was at uh, uh, Stephen's murder when he was being stoned to death. Uh, and what you see the very first time he's mentioned is that people are laying their coats at his feet as they're throwing stones. And literally every time I read that, I, in my mind's eye, I picture they're getting ready to, to, to pelt Stephen with all these stones, right? And there's one guy who his coat kind of got caught, right? And he couldn't throw it right. And Saul was like, yo, I'll take your coat for you. I, I want you to get, you know, the, the full range of motion as you throw that rock, right? And he takes his coat from him. And then there are other people that see Saul taking those coats. And so they too take their coats and lay it at his feet, right? I, I picture that. And what's so crazy about that when you see this uh, and at the end of Acts chapter 7, while this is happening, while stones are being pelted at, at, at Stephen, it says that it pleased Saul. It said that he approved of this. And essentially, when you look at that language approved, essentially it means that it made him happy. Like seeing someone else die brought Saul joy. Let that sink in this morning. It brought him joy. And then we'd see that it would go on to kind of spark this bloodlust in his, in his life, right? That, that, that what we see is why at the beginning of, of Acts chapter 8, this is why so many people disperse is because Saul saw that, got angrier, and started to persecute the church more and more. It said that he had access to where he could just bust into people's homes, men and women, and throw them in prison, see people persecuted, and see them be put to death. And we know that he was putting people to death because Saul would later share in the book of Acts, we see obviously at the very beginning of Acts chapter 9 here, but in Acts chapter 22, Paul says this, I persecuted this way. 
are persecuted this way, talking about Jesus' followers, to the death, arresting and putting both men and women in jail. Acts chapter 26, he says this, I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. Again, that same language, I approved of it. it. It made me happy. It brought me joy to see this take place. Now, as Paul is saying this, this is when he was a follower of Jesus now. He's reminiscing back on how he lived this life. Saul would be the last person, if you knowing that now, knowing his, his, his brokenness here. And, and if I can frame it a little bit more, it's easy for us to just read Scripture and go from chapter to chapter to chapter, right? It's easy for us to read Acts chapter 7. Oh, Paul, Saul was just, you know, allowing people to throw rocks at this guy, right? And then we see Acts chapter 8, they disperse, and then we see here in 9 that he, can't, he comes to know Jesus, right? Praise God. But there we need to understand there are months in between this. There's a lot of stuff happening. For all we know, there are multiple people that had died, multiple people that were put in prison, multiple people that were persecuted because they were following Jesus, and Saul was the chief. He was leading this out. So knowing that, we would think, again, Saul would be the last person that would come to know Jesus. But as we're going to see today, that's the beautiful thing about grace. Grace is no respecter of persons. Grace is no respecter of persons. When Scripture says that God does not desire for anyone to perish, that means everyone, no matter what they've done, no matter how heinous the crime, how twisted the sin, everyone has an opportunity to respond to the grace of Jesus. And so as I already stated already, my hope today is that as we look at this story, we will either leave out of here with renewed hearts of joy because of the grace that Christ has given us, or we leave out of here understanding that grace personally for the very first time. You ready? Okay, dope. Five of you are ready. Let's go. <laughs> Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, it says. He went to the high priest. He requested letters to go from the synagogues, to go into homes, to find men and women who belonged to the way and bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, we see in verse 4, this light from heaven suddenly flashed around him, falling to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This, what I'm about to say, has um, somewhat to do with the story, but I just thought it was really interesting here uh, that I think just we need to bring it out. Do you notice what Jesus says? Why are you persecuting me, right? Why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, hey, why are you persecuting these individuals, why are you persecuting, you know, this organization? No, he says, why are you persecuting me? Guys, before we keep on going, I want us to understand that Jesus is so united to his church that he sees it as one and the same. I love that. I have a question for you. Jesus sees himself united to the body, do you? I know I harp on the involvement in the body of Christ often here, but there's a, there's a reason why, and we see that here. You can't say that you love Jesus, but take no part in the happenings of the body. Essentially, there should be no separation between love of Jesus and commitment to his body. And I'm saying, if it's not this local body, let it be another body somewhere that's going to push you to remember the love that Jesus has for you in the church, okay? It's that love that he has for you that compels you to love others through your service to them. Jesus is the head of the body. The body is his church. You can't have the head without the body. You can't have the body without the head. Does that make sense? This is what I mean by that. If you love Jesus, but you hate his church, you've just decapitated the object of your affection. This is what Jesus is saying to Paul here. You aren't just hurting individuals. I don't want you to think that you're just hurting individuals. You're hurting me. And Paul's response here, verse 5, who are you, Lord? <laughs> Isn't that so funny? Is that, am I the one to find that part so funny? Who are you, Lord? You know who I am. You literally just called me Lord, bro. <laughs> Saul said, really? I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm the one you're persecuting. But I love his gracious response to him. I love it. Verse 6, get up, go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one again. I find those verses interesting as well. This reminds me of Romans chapter 1, where it says that truth is revealed to everyone, 
Everyone has access to the same truth. Essentially, everyone has access to that, but not everyone will respond to said truth. Some are going to read the same books, sing the same songs, attend the same church, but some will see the real Jesus and others will miss the real Jesus. It's just a thought, another side note that I put in there that I was like, I'm going to throw in there. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground. Though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And so the people that were with him took him by hand, led him into Damascus. Verse 10, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, another response, right? He replied, get up, go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In the vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming, placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias said, I've heard from many people about this man. How much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. He has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Again, I love reading the Bible because you see, you see real emotions, real objections, right? The Lord speaks to Ananias in a vision and says, go to Saul. And Ananias is like, wait a minute. <laughs> we talking about the same person, right? The, the, the Saul that's out here just throwing the saints in jail, that Saul? We, we, we sure about that, right? The Saul that's out here holding coats while people getting hit with, with, with rocks? That one, Jesus, this Saul, maybe your vision is a little blurry, but I see. <laughs> I don't know about this one, right? Verse 15, he said, no, that's him. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I'll show him how much he will suffer in my name. And if you read all the New Testament, you see he suffered indeed. But it was for, his, for the glory of God. And I went, entered the house, placed his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He got up, was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength because he ain't eaten three days. Praise God, he finally got something in his belly. And he was with the disciples of Damascus for some time. And this is the conversion of Saul. I love it. This story here is of amazing grace, and I need you to hear me say this out of the gate. God's grace knows no limits, family. God's grace knows no limits. And that's good news for us because every single one of us come in here week after week, burdened, broken, <laughs> defeated, heavy-hearted, questioning where we stand with God sometimes. And I need you to hear me say this. God's grace meets you right where you are, just like it does Saul. What does that look like? Well, four things, and we'll get out of here today, okay? Number one, grace meets us when we least expect it. Grace meets us when we least expect it. As you read the New Testament and you read many of Saul turned Paul's letters, you come to realize that what he was doing, he thought it was a good thing. He thought he was doing God a favor. Saul was a devout Jew. Uh, in some of his letters, he talks about his zeal for God, how he felt his keeping the law and seeking to maintain some sort of righteousness on his own was a good thing. He felt that anything that went against maintaining the Jewish law was a crime. So when all these Jews were converting to, to Christianity, all these individuals were, were understanding the truth of Jesus, he saw it as them betraying the religious moral authority of the day and they were now enemies. He waged war against them. He had permission to imprison them, and even in the case of Stephen and many others, sanctioned their death. And in his mind, he thought he was doing a good thing. Saul was lost. Can I ask you a question this morning? Do you, do you remember when, how you once lived your life, how you thought that you were doing a good thing too? that you felt how you operated was fine, was okay, it wasn't really that bad, right? That what you were doing and the way that you were living brought joy, but in reality, it wasn't really fulfilling. See, some of you remember that, and there are some of you in here who are living that way right now. But here's the thing with that. Whether you lived it or if you're living in it right now, deep down inside, you know that something is still off. That you say, yeah, I know God, I know who he is, but deep down, you aren't sure if you really do or don't. 
But instead of trying to get that figured out, you try to be content with living the way that you are, but you know, again, something's off, something's not right. Later, when Paul recounts this moment in the book of Acts when he meets Jesus, in Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 18, he mentions something that Jesus said to him that we actually don't see right here. He's talking about this conversion story. He's sharing his testimony, and he says that when Jesus met him, he says this in verse 14. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I was like, oh, that's weird. That sounds odd. (laughs) Why is that important to mention right now? Well, what Paul was getting at is this. A goad was this prod jabbed in the back of an ox's leg essentially kicking against it. I wonder what had been prodding against Saul. The death of Stephen? The sudden growth of the church? The way Christians died joyfully? You guys remember when Stephen died? He he was looking into heaven rejoicing. I'm I'm coming, Lord, essentially. I, I see you standing up. I see you about to embrace me joyfully. Paul was ticked about that. So much so that we see that he gets more violent. And here's what I'm getting at. Some of us live our lives oftentimes where we know, we feel conviction, we feel this prodding, right? But even in the prodding, even in the conviction, even in the Holy Spirit calling us into holiness, we kick against the goads. We have unanswered questions about life or death or God. We see joy in other people's lives and we wonder, how come that joy is, I I don't have that joy. We see love in other people's lives, and we're like, man, how come I don't have that love that I see in the Christian community? Maybe you've been here this weekend, and you're seeing it. As we were singing, and hands were up, and people were crying, you're like, what's going on? How come my response is never that way? You aren't necessarily sure what it is, and so you find yourselves busying yourself with good things, right? You jump into serving, hoping that they'll answer your questions. You might attend a family group, hoping they'll answer your questions. You busy yourself with good things, hoping they'll answer your questions. You come to church regularly, hoping they'll answer your questions. My friend, the answer to that question is this. You are lost. You're lost. But the hope in that is that grace still meets you there. Jesus meets you there. That's where and how he met Saul. Listen, if you ask anyone in this room that says that they have met Jesus, that they've encountered Jesus, they will all tell you in some version, their own version of their story, that they knew that they were lost. But grace. Grace hit them like a ton of bricks. And they realized this is what they should be going after, chasing after. That's that's the whole premise of amazing grace. How sweet the sound, it saved a wretch like me, right? I once was lost, but now I'm Blind, but now I see. That's amazing grace. For Saul, he was met with that amazing grace on the road headed to Damascus to continue ravaging the church. He was on his way to keep on sinning. He was on his way to keep on messing up. And for some of you, many of you, that's where grace needs to find you. Right in the midst of demise. For some of you, grace is finding you because you've been invited to church today. For some of you, grace is finding you because you've heard about Proclamation Church in some way, shape, or form, and you're able to sit down right here in this moment and hear about God's grace for you. It's just taking some time to get to it. But here's the thing. You hear about God's grace. You're being confronted with God's grace. But even sometimes when we find it and we hear about it, oftentimes we're still blind to the reality of what it is, which leads me to the second thing this morning. Grace allows us to see the truth of who Jesus is. There's something to be said about what took place with Saul when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? When he was confronted, he got up, and what happened? He couldn't see, right? Paul's blindness, I believe, is given as a picture of all people separated from Christ. I heard this from my pastor, uh, Pastor J.D. Greer. He says there are two primarily forms of, of blindness. He says the first type of blindness is irreligious blindness, that you believe that your way is better than God's, and so you don't need God. And so you pursue what the Bible calls sin. And usually, if we're honest, sin is great, right? That's why we jump into it. It makes us feel good. 
We enjoy it. It brings joy for a season, but then when you realize that you've been going on and on and on with it, it leaves you broken. And not only does it leave you broken, you look back and there's a string of relationships that are broken behind you as well. You find yourself unhappy. And sometimes God's grace meets you there and you realize, man, I've been blind. I've been treating God like the enemy, but he's not. And there are some of you who are in that category, and I hope you see, I hope you see that and realize that, and you quit kicking against the goads this weekend. There's a second form of blindness. And this is where I feel many of us might be because we are in the religious south, right? The Bible belt, if you will. I'm, I'm pretty sure Nashville might be the buckle of that belt to be determined. The second form of blindness is religious blindness. Do you think that you can be good enough to earn God's approval? That if you just try hard, that if you keep the rules, if you're good enough, then God will accept you. And here's the problem with that. You ready for this? I'm, I'm about to hit on all of our hearts this morning. <laughs> the problem with our good deeds is that they are hypocritical because they're actually covering up the real shape of our hearts. Essentially, what we see is that our hearts are ultimately selfish and the things that we try to do, even in our good, are often done for pride to prove to ourselves and to others about how good we actually are. Martin Luther calls this the evil of our good deeds. He said, we know we need to repent of our sin, but we also need to repent of the bad motives for our righteousness. Well, good works done from a spiritually dead heart as an attempt to lead to self-justification, what does that do? It leads to weariness, right? Right? And then it leads to constant comparison. This is what I mean by that. How am I stacking up to others? I see how other people are doing it. Am, am I there too? Am I living in the same way that they are? Guys, I know I can't be the only person that's dealt with this. Okay, I guess I am. I, I'm preaching to me then. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. We all there. Let's go. <laughs> We've all been there. Because here's the thing, when you start to compare yourself, right, comparison will either lead to pride or despair. And this is what I mean by that. When we're comparing ourselves to each other and we, or, or, when pride comes up, we're like, yo, I'm good, or I'm better than that person, right? Or it leads to despair, where it's like, I can't be as good as that person. What's wrong with me? We've all been there. And it's a vicious cycle. And then what feeds into that is jealousy, Right? Because we want to be like that person, we just can't seem to do it. Oh, I'm, I'm speaking. We, we hitting on some hearts this morning. But I'll keep on doing it, Bishop. <laughs> what happens after that jealousy begins to fester? It turns into hatred and fear. They threaten me. So I don't want to be around them. I, I want to remove myself from the situation. So we find ourselves moving ourselves from Christian community. And then it leads to violence. That's why some religious people are some of the meanest people on the planet. They're like Paul. They seem to be really good, but when we get down to it, they aren't very nice. You ever seen some religious people on Twitter? It's toxic. Block them immediately. Contrast all of that to the reality of the gospel family. A gift of grace. Grace that meets us where we are, right? And Jesus Christ dying in our place, paying the penalty for our sin, clothing us in his righteousness, giving us his resurrection, the power of new life and a new heart. And when Saul experienced this, it changed his heart forever. He was blind, but now he could see, literally and spiritually. And as you read the New Testament, as you read his letters that he's written, you hear that in the things that he says. You hear that. Things like in, in Romans, oh, wretched man that I am, who going who gonna to save me? Praise be to God. He recognized his brokenness, but immediately could say, but God, right? This is who I was. I was an enemy, but God. I was broken, but God. I was sinful, but God. He realized who he was, but realized that he experienced the grace of Jesus. Amen. You see his passion 
for, for the gospel come in because he realizes that he never deserved it. That's why he could say early on in those, in those chapters, yo, I was out here murdering people. I was out here killing people. This is who I was. But God met me still and loved me in spite of that. This is the grace that we all need. Now wonder, loved one, if some of you are still in here blind to the truth that God loves you in spite of the things that you've done. Maybe you're at a spot where you can finally acknowledge that you indeed are still lost, that you are blind, but even as you recognize your blindness, there's something inside of you that believes that you're too far gone or your sins are too deep that they, can tru- they can't truly be forgiven. And because of this, you need to realize this. Number three, you are never too far from the grace of Jesus. I love how Ananias reacts to the Lord and his vision about going to Saul. I love that. Because it's real. It's raw. It's honest, right? Because it would be the same reaction that we would have to our worst enemy. It really would be. It would be like if, if, if Jesus came to us in a vision and said, hey, you know, Pastor Jordan, I, I want you to go minister to Osama bin Laden. Yep. Right? Jordan like, nah, I'm good. I'm good on that. I, I know what Osama bin Laden has done. Right? I, I know how radical he was. You got to send somebody else. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Ananias is like, you, are you really sending me to that guy? And God's like, yeah, that guy. And God's response will always be, yeah, that guy. I heard it said once that the gospel isn't offensive because of who it lets out. It's offensive because of who it lets in. Because here's the thing. If we get down to the root of it, every single one of us holds the title of that guy or that girl. None of us deserve the grace of Jesus. But family, he gives it to us anyway. Why? Because he's loving. He's loving. There are two aspects of the gospel that I feel like are really difficult for for many of us to believe. That we are so bad that Jesus had to die to save us. That's one that we have a hard time believing. The second is that he was so gracious that he was glad to die to save us. Which do you have more trouble believing? If it's the first one, that you were so bad that he had to die... Here's how you know that you struggle with that. This idea of being eternally separated from God or other people being eternally separated from God offends you. I know I got emails coming my way. I know. It's okay. Help me, Jesus. If this offends you, it's probably because you think that you're really not that bad. All throughout Scripture, it says... There ain't nobody righteous. You're an enemy. You're far gone. All these things are the reality of what it means for us to be broken human beings. And when God steps in and saves us, guess what? He didn't do it because he thought that there was good in us. He didn't do it because the potential that we have. He did it because he was merciful. He did it because he was loving. He did it because he was gracious. Maybe you don't wrestle with that thought. Maybe you wrestle with the idea that he loves you so much that he'd be glad to die for you personally. If I'm honest, this is the one that I've struggled with often. You ain't got to convince me that I'm a sinner. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't wrestle with the first one. I know your boy is broken. I've seen it all throughout my life. I'm going to see it until the day I die. I don't wrestle with that one. I wrestle with knowing that I'm loved. So much so that he'd be willing to die in my place. So much so that I wouldn't have to face the wrath of God. That he'd be willing to pour that grace, that love, that mercy on me, knowing I didn't deserve it. Because I know that I'm a sinner. Because I know I've done wrong. Guys, when it comes to understanding the grace of Christ towards us, we need to understand it as this way, that I am worse than I ever dreamed that I would be. 
but he is more gracious and loving than we could ever have hoped. So you've, ever ex- you've either experienced that love firsthand, or you're wondering if you are deserving of that love at all. And I want to let you know, none of us are deserving of that love. But he gives it to us anyway. He gives it to us anyway. That's why it's called grace. Family, we need to understand that amazing grace is only amazing when we come to grips with how sinful we actually are. But even though we are sinful, we aren't that far gone from his grace. His grace can still reach us. Because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more towards us. So I mean, there are many of you who've come in here today. You're carrying burdens. They're weighing you down. Can I truly be this love? Can I truly be this fought for? Can I truly be this forgiven? Yes. It's as simple as that. And if you don't believe it, look no further than Saul. He was a murderer. He was out for blood. He was mistreating innocent individuals. And the Lord told Ananias, had the audacity to say, I have a plan for him. If he had a plan for Saul, you can believe that he has a plan for you as well. Which leads me to this as I land the plane. Your sin does not disqualify you from receiving and proclaiming the grace of Jesus to others. Your sin does not disqualify you from receiving and proclaiming the grace of Jesus to others. Look again at verse 15. The Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles and kings and Israelites. Now, I don't know if myself or any of you will ever have the audience of a king. If you're a king in here, Come talk to me. I got a whole parking lot I need you to pave in Jesus' name. (laughs) But I don't think I'll ever meet a king. Some of you may. I don't know. But God still has a plan for our lives. There are people that we will interact with that God has a plan for their life as well. Here's the thing. At one point, the church's greatest physical enemy was converted to become one of its greatest missionaries. You've heard me say it before, I'll keep on repeating it because you know that old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But there's no such thing as a wasted experience. That God is in the business of teaching you who he is on the mountaintop as well as he is in the valley. That's who he is. So what that means, I'm about to try to categorize where many of us may fall, where many of us may not believe that God can still use us. What that means if he is teaching us who he is on the mountaintop And our valley experiences, that means that that divorce that you've gone through, that jealous streak that you have, that anger problem, that lust that you deal with, that addiction you can't break, that lie that you told, the emotional unhealth you walk in, that thing you wish you would have done differently in your life, that insert whatever you think disqualifies you from the plan of God, that if you believe that if people saw that and understood that about you, that it would just break you and wreck you, when you sit in it, it brings you shame. We all know that feeling. We all know that feeling of feeling unworthy enough or worthy enough to be useful to God because we believe that we're unworthy. We were rehearsing our heads over and over again, the failures and the letdowns and the wrongs that we have done, but can I let you in on a secret family? Being unqualified is what makes you qualified for the grace of Jesus. That is where we need to be. Being reminded of our brokenness, being reminded of the guilt, being reminded of the shame, and seeing that grace is still coming our way regardless of it. And the fact that God is still looking at every single one of us, knowing everything that we've done, knowing all of our mess, knowing all of our brokenness, and saying to us, Brother, sister, family, I've got a plan for you. I've got plans for you. That's why we see in Titus 3, 5, not by being good or the righteousness we've done, but according to his mercy he saves. That's why in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't your own doing. Essentially what Paul was saying in Ephesians, you couldn't do it. Christ had to do it for us. It's a gift from God. What that means is it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what sins 
you've committed, it doesn't matter what sins you are going to commit. It doesn't matter what your past experiences are, whether they be good or bad. Even if you don't feel worthy to belong to God, he wants you to be a child of his. And when that happens, he is going to equip you to proclaim his grace to others. You know, I wonder if the pain that God allows us to walk in sometimes makes us uniquely qualified to speak redemption to other people who've walked through the same things. He did it with Saul. Why couldn't he do it with us? I believe he can. And so if he can, I want to end by asking two questions this morning, okay? Number one, have you lost the wonder of God's grace? Put it another way, have you lost the awe of God's grace? Uh, Paul David Tripp said that uh, Christians oftentimes wrestle with awe amnesia, where at one point we see the goodness of God, we've experienced it, oh, it's, it, it, it's made us weepy, we love it, right? We've lived in it, we in our Bible study every day because we just got to get more Jesus, right? But then life happens and we forget the awe. We forgot what it felt like. And I wonder if we need to be at a spot of brokenness like David was in Psalm 51 and says, restore the joy of your salvation in my life. I need it. I need it. I need to be reminded of it. Because oftentimes we lose the awe of God's grace. You want to know how you know sometimes you've lost the awe of God's grace? Because maybe you find yourself like Ananias, unsure if God is gracious or powerful enough to save and to forgive that loved one in your family. That coworker that you can't stand being around. That neighbor that's all nosy all the time, amen? We don't think that God can really change their lives. And we may not say that, but we live that out because we're not talking about the goodness of the Lord in people's lives the way that we're called to do. Family, who are you looking to be saved? Do you believe that God's spirit can do it? And again, maybe it's not even what he can do in others. Maybe you've just lost the wonder of what he's done in your own life. Here's the beautiful thing about the Christian life that's so amazing. We get to come back to grace every single day. Every single day. You know that the, the, the passage in Lamentations is skipping me, the, the exact section where it is. I see it in my Bible. But we are waking up to new morning mercies every day, right? New morning mercies every day. You know what that means? That as soon as you wake up with crust still in your eye and your breath as ratchet as possible, mercy is there waiting for you. Grace is there waiting for you. And praise God because that's when we need it the most, amen? <laughs> Hello. We need it then. What makes the Christian life so amazing is we get to jump into it every single day for the rest of our lives because the reality is we're sinful every day, every day. But God's grace is there waiting for us, meeting us there. And we get to relish in that. You know, I pray that as you listen to how Jesus came after Saul is that you begin to realize that that's the same way that he's come after you. Same way. You may not have been blind and knocked off of a horse, but he's still meeting you on the, on the road, the road of life. He's meeting you where you are. Family, listen, when he meets you where you are, when he came after you, he grabbed hold of you, and guess what? He's never letting go. There's nothing that you can say, there's nothing that you could do that's going to snatch you from his hand. Even when you forget about his grace in your life. He's still offering it to you and inviting you deeper into it so we have an opportunity now to rest in that grace. Which leads to my second question today. Are you being pursued by God's grace? If you're here today, guess what? Every single one of you can answer yes to that question. You are being pursued by God's grace. Every moment you wake up, that's a picture that you're being pursued by God's grace. Every time you're able to, to hop in a car and move around and work and function and, and do anything, that's a picture of God's grace showing you that God's not done with you yet. 
But there's a difference between being pursued by God's grace and allowing yourself to be caught up in it. Two different things. To be caught up in it means I don't question where I stand. I know where I am. I know where I sit with God. That when he sees me, he doesn't see my mistakes. He doesn't see my failures. He doesn't see any of my letdowns. He sees me as a son or a daughter because I'm resting in the forgiveness that he offers me through Jesus Christ. It's like this. I've never flown a kite in a thunderstorm because Ben Franklin told me that wasn't a good idea, right? So I haven't. But when I get this picture of someone uh, uh, holding a kite out in a thunderstorm, it's never going down, right? The wind is just constantly picking it up, taking it up, lifting it higher and higher and higher, right? It may swoop down. It may be flying all over the place, but it's staying up because the wind is carrying it up. Guys, that's what grace does for us. That's what it means to be carried by grace. That's what it means to be caught up in grace. Grace meets us, and it sustains us, and it holds us, right? Because the same grace that saves us is what? Come on, come on. I know when I get tired of saying it, that's when people hear it for the first time, and y'all heard it. Praise God. (laughs) The same grace that saves us is the same grace that sustains us. It holds us up. It meets us where we are. It encourages us. It pushes us to be reminded that we can be forgiven when we feel like that we can't be. But there are some of us in here who are blind to that truth. That we feel like we just don't know if that means that we can be loved, that we can be forgiven, that we can be thought of in this way. And unfortunately, the scales haven't fallen off yet. Loved one, if that's you, Can I ask you a question? What's keeping you from believing that Jesus can truly save you? What's keeping you from believing that he actually, you personally, wants a relationship with you? That the God of the universe knows literally everything that you've done, good, bad, hidden in the dark, is still calling you into a relationship with him. What love? What love? And every single one of, one of us wants that type of love. And to say that we don't, <laughs> we're not being honest with ourselves. Because we pursue that love in all the wrong places, and every single time, it lets us down. But the love that Christ has for us will never fail us, will never let us down. So I wonder if I were to ask you today, hey, do you know, truly know the love that Christ has for you and you own that for yourself, how would you answer that question? If you would answer that question other than assuredly yes, I want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. I want to have a conversation with you. Because in my opinion, this is the most important decision that you could ever make in your life. I want you to be able to leave out of here in confidence, knowing that Christ's love, yes, we're talking about it, but that love is for you personally. That you can leave out of here, daughter of God. You can leave out of here, son of God. In the same way that he holds on to all those that belong to him, you would be included in that number, and he'll never, ever let you go. Christ is looking at you in the same way he looked at Saul, and he's saying, I have plans for you. I have plans for you. But those plans only begin when you surrender. You know, surrender oftentimes comes with the language of defeat, like you just lost, right? Not when it comes to Christ. When we use the language of surrender when it comes to Christ and the things of God, It's not loss, it's rest. It's rest. We live our lives trying to figure out work, get approval, all these different things. And Christ is saying, no, come to me and rest. He wants you to rest in him, to not worry about your future because he secured your future. But you have to believe, you have to surrender. So this is how we're going to end. Pastor Jordan, do you mind... uh, Tickling the ivories for us, please. Thank you. 
we want to end praying. Uh, our prayer team is going to come up. They're going to be up here to, to meet you, pray with you, if you would like. There's some of you who are just like, man, I'm not sure if I'm ready to pray with anyone. I need you to hear me say, that's okay. Where you're sitting right now, I want you to deal with you and God on your own. Because like I said earlier, you fall into one of two categories here. One, you truly understand who God is. You've rested in him, but you've lost the awe of his grace in your life. Maybe you just need to ask the Holy Spirit to, again, to renew that joy, that salvation that you, that you had, that you have. And allow yourself to leave out of here rejoicing, floating on cloud nine, if you will, knowing that you're forgiven. There's another group of people, though, those who would say that they've never trusted Jesus. Or they would say, at one point, I feel like I have, but I'm just not sure. And if that's you, I, I want you to deal with God where you would really embrace his love for you, that he wants to forgive you, that he wants to call you his own, that he wants to call you son, he wants to call you daughter. You spend some time and you pray, and if you have questions, we're up here. We'll talk with you. There's no shame here. There's no guilt here. There's only grace. You take some time and you pray, and I'll close this out in just a second.